So I'm going to keep this super quick and um, talk about something super high level that's been really impactful for my team, um, which is this totally fake and fictional story about an elevator. Um, but to give you a little bit of um, background on myself to prove that um, I at least am a real human and have done a one thing um, is when I was in college, I started a company called Spoon University, which is a food website for college students. So it's kind of similar to Tasty, and we're in the Tasty space um, in that we have recipes and restaurant reviews and healthy eating tips and all kinds of um, food content online. Um, we also have the print magazines that I just showed that are still being published at Northwestern University where we started Spoon. Um, but all the content on Spoon is created by college students on campuses all over the world. And um, the back end that helps make this happen is a thing that we call Secret Sauce, which, it, which is our software that lets all these college students all over the world um, build communities on their campuses, go through online courses, online training, and writing, and photography, and videography, and um, all, kinds of, all, all, all kinds of stuff like that, and then actually use our tools to to produce all the content. So we have um, an article CMS and an in-browser video editor, so they don't need to use video editing software and analytics tools and all that good stuff. Um, and it was all this that made Spoon and that we sold to Scripps Networks, who owns Food Network and Travel Channel and HGTV um, and stuff like that, and they were just acquired by Discovery. Um, so now we're at a big company and people keep saying to us, wow, you guys built so much with such a small team because there were only um, 30 of us when we sold the company. There are still only 30 of us. Um, so it's a super small team. And I always think that's so funny because um, I think we built a lot in a lot of ways because we have a really small team. And I think that um, one of the ways that like it helps to be a really small team is that you have to really isolate your problems and you have to strictly prioritize. And the teams are so small that everyone like has ownership over the problems. and feels like it's their responsibility to, to really figure out what's going on. And I think that it's when you have more people involved and it's a bigger, it's a bigger company, you can often have a situation where um, all of a sudden a problem is delivered to you and it's your job to solve it and it's way easier to solve the problem on the piece of paper in front of you than it is to figure out if that's actually the problem. Um, which leads me to the elevator problem. Um, which is my totally fictional story that my entire team uses to talk about problems that are fake problems. So if you imagine a hotel, and a guy owns a hotel, and um, all of his guests keep complaining to him that the elevator is way too slow. And they say that, like, like everybody who comes into the hotel is complaining that the elevator is way too slow. So he keeps getting this feedback, he keeps getting this feedback, and he's convinced that he has to fix the speed of the elevator. So he calls the elevator repairman, who comes and says that it now takes 30 seconds to get from the first floor to the 10th floor of the hotel. And um, if he just pays a couple hundred thousand dollars, the elevator guy can fix the elevator, and then it'll take only 20 seconds to get from the first floor to the 10th floor. So it's a 33% increase in the speed of the elevator, and it's only gonna cost him a couple hundred thousand dollars, and this is what everyone is asking for, and then all of his problems will be solved. This is the clearest problem there was to solve in the history of problems. Except for the fact that if you really think about the fact that all the people who, like a lot of people, like all the people that are in the hotel, a lot of them are brand new to the hotel, don't ride in the elevator for more than a couple of times. So they're certainly not gonna get in the elevator and remember what it was like for the elevator to take 30 seconds instead of 20 seconds and be like, wow, I'm so glad that I saved 10 seconds. That's probably not actually what's bothering the people in the elevator. So instead of doing that, he put mirrors on the back wall of the elevator so that people could look at themselves while they were going up and down. And then people stopped complaining because the problem was not that the elevator was too slow, despite the fact that all these people were saying it. The problem was the fact that people were bored and they wanted to look at themselves in the elevator. And I think that that's such an amazing example because it teaches us that while it's so important to listen to users and it's so important to listen to stakeholders, it's even more important to try to figure out what's actually going on underneath what people are saying. And you can't trust what they're saying all the time. Um, so we have a couple telltale signs of when we're interacting with an elevator problem, and we just call them all elevator problems. Um, the first is when a problem is delivered to you that's already tied directly to a solution. So someone's like, 
this is the problem that I want to solve and this is how we're going to solve it and I would love for you to implement it. Please, very quickly, thank you. And usually, that's not the right solution. Um, the second telltale sign is that um, someone comes to you and says something like, how hard is it to do X, Y, and Z? And usually, that's not the right question because usually, like, everything is kind of, or, or, or it'll be like, is it possible to do X, Y, and Z? And you're like, well, technically, Yes, it's possible. I know how we do that. But the real question is, why would we want to do that thing? And now all of a sudden, you've accidentally spent 10 minutes answering the question about how hard is it to, or is it possible to, despite the fact that you don't actually want to do that thing. And then the last telltale sign is if the problem is way too big to be solved. So sometimes people will say, you know, well, the users aren't interacting with this thing because they're just too lazy to interact with this thing. But that doesn't sound like a, a problem that I'm interested in trying to solve. Um, so we have a, like, a set of three questions that we always try to use whenever we're interacting with, like, like as soon as we realize that we're probably interacting with an elevator problem, we have three big questions that we try to ask everyone on the team um, to try to figure out what the real problem might be underneath these layers. And I think it's so important to have these kinds of conversations happen before you talk about implementation of any kind of problem as a team. Because all this, because this, these questions and taking time to answer these questions before you actually get, get to implementation can save you so much time later when you would have been chasing your tail building a solution for a problem that didn't exist. Um, so the first question that almost no one ever asks is how did this question come to be discussed? Like why are we even sitting around talking about this thing? Which so many people take for granted. Like the fact that we're talking about this thing thusly necessitates the fact that we must talk about this thing. Um, but a lot of the time, we're talking about this thing because users brought it up. And just like in the elevator example, it's so valuable to know that, that users are having a problem. Like, we need to know that. We need to get that feedback. But just because a user says that this is their problem doesn't mean that that's actually their problem or that the solution that seems obvious from that problem is going to be the best solution for them. We can also be talking about things because we have internal stakeholders who want us to talk about things. But it's also so important to keep in mind that so many internal stakeholders, and when I talk about internal stakeholders, I mean people on other teams and um, like, like within the, the company itself. And we have so many people on the team that, that have very specific goals that are, that are incentivized in very specific ways. And in, especially for teams like design and product engineering teams that are so often like simultaneously involved in strategy and also support functions, trying to prioritize all the requests of internal stakeholders is going to make it so that you're like like everything is going to be on the same level and it's it's almost impossible to do that unless you put all of those requests from internal stakeholders into perspective and relative to each other um, so it's so important to keep that in mind too and then also we could be talking about a problem because it's like a goal from the top because someone in leadership somewhere suggested that we talk about a thing and sometimes people in leadership talk about things because they're trying to strategically change the role of a, like, like a huge part of the company. They're trying to, um, they're, they're setting an objective and a key result. They're changing a KPI that we all have to pay attention to and, and now we have to solve a new problem. Sometimes people just say things as ideas or suggestions and then all of a sudden people are running after those ideas, chasing after them, trying to solve all these problems that aren't actually being, that shouldn't be prioritized and aren't the, and aren't the purpose of the conversation. So it's so important to make sure that even before we talk about a problem, that we know why we're talking about it, who brought it up, what the point of talking about this whole thing is. Once we've decided that this is a conversation worth having, um, then we have to know what the most basic problem is. So to use our elevator example, um, we should first try to be goal-oriented. So what should the outcome of our solution look like? So the fact that we know is that people are complaining that the elevator is too slow. So is the ideal outcome that the elevator is faster or is the ideal outcome that people are happy? And I think the ideal outcome is that people are happy and not complaining. So that's our first indication that there's a gap between the elevator itself and people being happy. Like those two things, that's an assumption that we're making that the elevator is related to people's happiness. It's, it's a hypothesis that we have, and we have reason to believe that the elevator is related to their happiness, but 
The fact that this, the speeding up of the elevator would then result in people being happier isn't necessarily true. So speaking of assumptions, we can play out different hypothetical circumstances um, to try to call out those assumptions. So just like the owner of the hotel did in our example, he played out hypothetically in his head, okay, if I actually speed up the elevator, if I try to imagine myself getting the elevator, I'm really, I'm really like I'm sitting in the elevator and it's 30 seconds and I'm so bored and I'm waiting to get to where I wanna go and I finally get there and I'm so happy I'm there and now I get in the elevator tomorrow, I probably wasn't counting and I probably didn't know it was 30 seconds and now that it's 20 seconds, I'm probably not even gonna realize and that's a really important thing to notice about yourself, hypothetically, in that moment. And also that in that moment, how were you feeling? You were probably bored. So then all of a sudden, you now have this new, you, have, you now have empathy for the user in this, in this situation in a new way. And you think, okay, in that, in that moment, I was feeling bored. And what are the ways that I can solve boredom? I could play music. I could give you something to look at, like the standard elevators. Have you seen the elevator art? Um, and we can give you things to see, like yourself. So that's us considering other hypotheses. And then we also need to keep in mind that we are separating facts from value judgments whenever we're pulling in all the evidence that we have to um, look at when we're solving problems. So if the, like, if the fact that we have is not necessarily that the elevator is too slow, because if the elevator is too slow, then people just aren't getting to the, like, like if the elevator is too slow, then people aren't getting to the floor at the time that they're supposed to be getting to the floor. That would be like if we had an elevator in a hospital and doctors couldn't get to the right emergency room because the elevator was too slow. But if they're slower than people want them to be because they're bored, then that's a very different fact. And the fact is people are just unhappy. So then the third question is, and this is again before we get into implementation at all, is just what are your constraints? So the first constraint that I think we should talk about is time, but not in the way that people typically talk about time as a constraint, because it's not how long will this take us to pull off, but it's on what time horizon do we need to solve this problem? So is this like a bug that we need to fix immediately because it's, it's, it's preventing people from getting work done or preventing people from using our product? Or is this a long-term change that we need to do something about because we see a strategic shift in the market and we have to capitalize on that? And if it's something as large and structural as the second thing, is this just a product change or is there re-education involved here? Because then that's a huge, massive thing that's way bigger than just a small change in a button. And how, do, how does re-education of our consumer and of our user, how does, that, how does that come into play? The second is resources. Um, and I think that a good way to think about this is in relation to your hypotheses that we were talking about when we were questioning our assumptions before. And if we think about the resources that are required to test both of our elevator hypotheses, one, to test if the elevator speed would impact their happiness, we'd have to pay a couple hundred thousand dollars to get the elevator repair guy to fix it. But if we want to test if boredom is the solution to the like user happiness problem, all we have to do is put mirrors in the elevator. So all of a sudden that hypothesis becomes so much easier to test and we can just get an answer much more quickly. And then finally, what are the consequences of being wrong? So if we pick one of these hypotheses, if we pick the mirror hypothesis and we're wrong because the elevator really is too slow, we're not actually in a worse spot at all. We might have lost the week that it took us to install the elevators and check to see if people are happier or if the complaints went down. But to a certain extent, there's no consequence there. And if we pay a lot of money to see if the elevator um, speed would impact their happiness, and that wasn't necessarily the main factor in the user's happiness problem, now we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and are very upset that people are still upset. Um, so I, I've kind of like talked a lot about this elevator problem, so I wanna give you one other case study really quickly on how like this just happened. I, I was in a conversation with a friend last week about a um, mentorship company that she's running that pairs mentors and mentees. Um, and she was saying, our biggest problem is that we need to build a machine learning algorithm to match mentors and mentees. And I, like my spidey senses were tingling at that elevator problem because it's not a problem that you need to build a machine learning matching algorithm. That's a solution. And so the question then is, what's the real problem below we need to build a machine learning matching algorithm for our mentors and mentees? The assumption there is that, um, and her, her biggest problems, like so many products, are around 
making sure that she is retaining all the people on her platform. She wants to make sure that all the people that sign up are signing up again and again and keep, and keep using her product. So if her main like KPI is retention that we're talking about here, then the assumption that she's making with this problem is that people are not being retained, people are stopping to use the platform because the matches that they're getting aren't good enough. And I use her platform and I love it and I have always gotten perfectly great matches. And so I was confused about why, like, like if I'd gotten a girl, if I'd gotten matched with somebody who like had a little bit, was a little bit more aligned to my interests or like, I don't know, was into, was also into reading sci-fi, then like maybe I would have had like a minimally better experience, but probably not. And so the first, well, so I guess the first thing, how did this question come to be discussed, is um, like the, the way that we realize that this is an elevator problem is because this, is, this was just the solution, not the problem. And then we get into the basic problem, which is not the, um, it's, it's not the matching algorithm. Or at least in my experience, it's not the matching algorithm. And I think that a deeper problem for like her retaining mentors using her platform is whether or not people feel like they're being impactful. So if people feel like they're being impactful, no matter who they're matched with, then they're going to be sure to, oh, it went away. Then they're going to be sure to come back again and again. Um, so if that's, the, if that's our second hypothesis, then we can try having more curated and personalized content while the mentors and mentees are being matched so that they can be sure that their interactions themselves are more impactful. So that once they actually get in the room and they're being paired with somebody, so that that experience feels really impactful. And then the question is, what are the constraints? Um, for these two hypotheses, for the fact that we need better matching and we need machine learning algorithms to make that matching happen, versus we just need better, more personalized content to make the interactions more impactful, um, the machine learning algorithm is is gonna take a lot more resources. We don't have a data scientist who can build this machine learning algorithm. And um, like th that, that's a significantly more technically complicated problem to solve. As opposed to, we already have a lot of content produced for these experiences. How can we create multiple um, like sets of content so that it can feel more personalized? So now, this second hypothesis is significantly easier to test. We can test it immediately in our current users, and we can get feedback for whether or not the second hypothesis is actually solving the root problem of why mentors aren't being retained in the platform. So in conclusion, um, I think it's really important for all teams of all sizes to, to participate strategically in these, in these conversations before people start implementing designs because so often we just take the problems that were being served and we don't, um, or we just execute implementations that, that we're being asked to, to execute on, instead of actually taking a minute to figure out if we're solving the root problem. And if we don't solve the root problem, then we just end up chasing our tails. Um, but the whole team needs to buy into the strategic value of solving problems this way. And I think that shared language can be a great way to start that problem. Or it can be, it can be a great place to start. And um, the shared language that we use on our team is elevator problems so that really quickly we can all just get to the same place of understanding, um, which is that somebody might be not isolating the root cause of the issue they're trying to solve. Any questions? Sarah, thank you. I love that example, the elevator problem. You had me thinking about a dozen of my own. So uh, we'll open up to probably two questions if uh, folks have them. Don't be shy. Um, I've got one for you. Um, so in the, uh, in the context of working in the Discovery family now, um, as you're building out a larger team, what are some things that you look for in people that you bring on your team? Um, well, I think that in general, like our team is still kind is still operating as uh, as the spoon team within the larger space, which has been really great for us. So we're still really small and scrappy and looking for people who want to like have ownership over a problem. I think that like decentralizing ownership through the team has one of the things that has helped us do things like this, make sure that people feel like they can participate actively in, um, in deciding what problems are solved and how they solve them as opposed to just making those things happen. So we look for like examples of people taking ownership and being and taking initiative a lot. How do you test for that in an interview? 
It's really hard. It's usually in stories people tell and how they talk about their past experience. And it often comes when people are talking about, like, about moments of frustration in their past jobs. Because if people talk about a moment of frustration and they're like, I was really frustrated because I wanted to do this thing and I couldn't do it, then it's like, okay, what happened when you asked your boss about wanting to do that thing? Or what, what happened when you pushed there? Like, how did you, like, get so much pushback again and again that that didn't happen and why did that happen? And pushing through, I think, on some of those examples um, helps, helps see if, like, where people are hitting roadblocks. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so open up for questions. I'm sensing the room, oh, we got one. Um, hi, I was just wondering, so when you're asking someone why they want something or when you're trying to just change the strategy about uh, problem solving, um, what are some strategies or advice you would give to uh, clients or coworkers that are really resistant to changing the way things are done. I just want to kind of stay set in their ways. Um, well, I think that, at a, like, to a certain extent, you, everyone has to buy into the fact that doing things the way they've been done before for only that reason, like that. That I feel like that should almost be an embarrassing thing to say. <laughs> um, but if you're in a space where people haven't bought into that, then I think that the only way that you can make that argument is to, is to be metrics driven to a certain extent, is to play out hypotheticals and talk about like, if this is our KPI at the end of the day, if this is what we're looking for, and you've been doing it this way and these are the results, we can't, like if, if, you, if you keep doing it that way, then those will be the same results. Like, it, like in the example of the machine learning um, algorithm, it's like, why, like, we, we, we have no reason to believe that a machine learning algorithm will actually increase retention because we have no reason to believe that mentors are currently leaving the program because their matches aren't sufficient. And I think if you can disprove some of those hypotheses in really explicit ways, then people are at least willing to have a conversation. Uh, hi there. Uh, I'm very impressed with your thought process throughout, you know, how you identify problems and solving it. You know, as you come from an entrepreneurial background, what are some of the problems that you're thinking about? Like if I'm someone who's looking for ideas to solve, like what are some of the problems that you're thinking about and wished, uh, you know, you could solve it? That's a good question. Um, well, I've been in the media space for a really long time, so the problems that I've been like thinking about in the fun parts of my brain outside of the media space. I think that there's there's a lot of really interesting stuff that can happen around preventative healthcare, especially using nutrition as preventative healthcare um, to like kind of help align incentives in like healthcare and health insurance. And um, I think there's a ton that can be done there. Um, I'm also really interested in mean, like like in this moment in figuring out how we can um, like help with gender and diversity um, issues. So how can we make sure that more girls are in STEM, for example? And I think that that starts at a really young age. And how can we kind of like change um, like societal expectations and ways that'll be impactful there? I don't know. Th those are my two areas that I'm focused on. I don't know if that's helpful. That's awesome. Sarah, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Yes.